Hello and welcome to Understanding Buddhism in America. My name is Mike, and today's shoutouts go to all of you listeners because I just got word that I've reached over 10,000 podcast downloads. 10,000, folks. That is a lot of people. And it seems to increase by about 500 to 1,000 a day. So I'm really looking forward to what this is developing into. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you very much. And in return, I'm going to give you what a lot of you have been asking for. The story of Buddha. Now, this story is pretty epic. And I intend to make it as entertaining as possible. And I'm going to do it in three podcasts. A lot of people in America are just completely unaware of the story of Buddha which is why many books on Buddhism start with it. I'm very aware of the story, but I don't mind rereading it, because each story tends to vary just a little. Every Buddhist country, community, and person remembers the story a little bit differently, and this is perfectly fine. You know that expression, set in stone? Buddha's story never really was. You can try and find the earliest possible written versions of it, but those only came after Buddha's death, and were probably decided on by a committee. Imagine if someone asked you today to join a committee that would write the biography of someone's life. You'd think it was crazy at first, I'm sure, but then you'd realize that not only was your point of view of that person too narrow to encompass all of their life, but also that an entire committee of people still really wouldn't give the full story. But Buddha never wrote an autobiography. In fact, he never wrote anything at all. Buddha existed before writing did. Yeah. Just blew your mind a little, didn't I? So he was a teacher, not a writer. The lessons he gave were tailored to the students he was giving them to. This is why it's not uncommon to find conflicting information in some of the Buddha's lessons. Instead of taking them for face value, you have to really think about the context in which they were given. So let's start on the story of Buddha. Of course, to begin the story, we have to stop calling him Buddha and start calling him Siddhartha. I would call him Sid. But that reminds me too much of that crazy pyromaniac neighbor from the first Toy Story. I'm getting ahead of myself, though, because the story of Siddhartha's birth is too legendary to leave out. So right now, don't imagine the Buddha, or Siddhartha. Instead, just imagine a queen named Maya. That's Maya, not Mayo. Maya was the queen of Kapilavastu, while Mayo is the queen of sandwiches. The queen Maya was married, of course, to a king. King Siddhadana of the Shakya clan would become the Buddha's future father, or the father of the future Buddha. Whatever works best for you. Now, a lot of people gloss over this little fact, but as it turns out, the king and the queen weren't just married, they were also cousins. As an American who's never been ruled over by royalty, this strikes me as really odd at first, but then I realize throughout history, royalty is almost always married within the family tree, as weird as it may seem in modern times. Now, for something like 20 years, this cousin couple didn't have any kids. I have a feeling this means they tried for a long time and it didn't work out. But truth be told, I've never actually read those words before. So maybe they thought the whole cousin-loving thing was a little weird, too. I just don't know. Anyways, one night, Queen Maya had a dream where a white elephant entered her womb through her side. I like to think that he didn't just charge in there and run her over, but rather that he was more like Casper, the friendly elephant, and just kind of ghosted in. When she woke up the next day, she was pregnant. Surprise! Now, whatever the king's thoughts were on the fact that he had probably tried to get the queen pregnant for 20 years, and in a single dream, some ghost elephant beat him to the punch, he put them aside in his excitement for finally having an heir to the throne. It was customary for the queen to return to her parents' home to give birth. Her father, the king's uncle, was also a king and ruled in a neighboring district. So Maya was strolling home one day with a belly full of Buddha and decided to take a rest in a beautiful place called the Lumbani Gardens. All around her were pretty plants and Ashoka blossoms. In case that sounded familiar, there was also a king named Ashoka who I talked about in the podcast There Is No Podcast. I like to say it like that every time I say it too. There is no podcast. Legend has it that when she reached out to pluck one of these Ashoka blossoms, her baby was born. His birthday was April 8th, or maybe May 8th, but there was definitely an 8 involved. Actually, the date was based on the Chinese lunar calendar, so this year, his birthday was on May 10th, 
next year it'll be on april 28th in 2013 it'll be on may 17th and so on in that uh order the king was so happy to hear the news that after 20 years of trying he had a son an heir to the throne and finally someone to play catch with he named the boy siddhartha which means every wish fulfilled or he who achieves his aim depending on who you ask either way that makes him just about the coolest dad in history i think The king's happiness was quickly followed by grief, though, as the Queen Maya unexpectedly died seven days after giving birth. I've never actually read a reason why she died, but I have to imagine that if you're pregnant and your baby just falls out of you while you're picking flowers, and there's nothing wrong with him, there's a good chance something might be wrong with you. Whatever the reason, her sister became Siddhartha's foster mom, and, with the king, brought him up to be a prince. There was a hermit named Asita who lived up in some mountains nearby and noticed a particular radiance around the castle that he interpreted to be a good omen. So he came down to see the boy. It was then that he made the prediction that the boy would either become the king of the entire world someday or he would become the savior of the entire world someday, depending on how long he stayed inside the palace. I assume the king was so filled with joy at that moment that he dropped to the floor and just invented breakdancing right there. But then he started to worry a little. All of the spiritual people in those times were homeless wanderers and beggars. Even Asita, the guy who made this prediction, just lived up in a mountain somewhere. Going from possible world ruler to possible beggar seemed scary to the king. So he decided to do what he thought was best. He locked up Siddhartha and he threw away the key. Alright, so that was a little dramatic. He didn't really imprison him. He treated him like the prince he was. He threw parties for him, kept loads of gorgeous women around him, gave him treasures, and I assume even went with him to the top of Pride Rock to tell him, One day, Siddhartha, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. You know, princely stuff. But the prince wasn't allowed to leave the palace without the king's permission, which usually meant the prince just wasn't allowed to leave the palace. Siddhartha then began lessons in military arts. And though some people believe he was a cunning warrior in practice, his coaches often remarked on how his head was never really in the game. One day, after what I assume was Siddhartha asking his father, but why, a legendary amount of times, the king decided to take the prince out of the palace. King Sudadana, and what I imagine he saw as an opportunity to bore the prince beyond belief and attempt to make the palace seem like a paradise, took Siddhartha to watch a farmer plow a field. While watching the field plowing and the grass growing, the prince noticed a bird swooping to the ground to catch and carry away a worm. He sat down under a tree, which you'll find out was one of his favorite things to do, and asked himself if all living things kill each other. The prince, because of the loss of his mother before he even got the chance to remember her, found the worm's death to be even more tragic than the dialogue in James Cameron's Avatar. This was his first real memory of suffering. And if this weren't a movie, I'm pretty sure the soundtrack would be going, dum dum dum. Now the king, probably hearing those ominous tones in the background, decided to try and cheer the prince up a bit. So he got him a woman. And at 19, Siddhartha was married to Princess Yoshidara, who, by the way, was also his cousin. I'd like to take this moment to tell America how much I appreciate our long history of not having arranged marriages with cousins. I understand the perceived notion that royal blood mixing with non-royal blood somehow dilutes the royalness of it, but not having to worry about ending up in bed with those people who send me sweaters for Christmas is a huge weight off my shoulders. For what must have been the ten most fun years in all of history, Siddhartha lived in the palace, surrounded by music, dancing, pleasures, family, friends, and just about everything he could ever want, except sweet and sour Twizzlers, but they weren't invented yet. But instead of spending all of his time enjoying the fun around him, he spent it pondering the meaning of suffering and the purpose of life. Now there's some debate as to what happened next. One version said he snuck out of the castle with his charioteer Chana, or Chandaka, and saw these four sights. An aging man, a sick person, a corpse, and an ascetic who had devoted himself to finding the cause of suffering. Another version said these happened on four separate occasions. And even another version said that the outing with his father when he saw the bird eat the worm was the only sight he saw. It doesn't really matter, though, because in all of these versions, the aftermath was the same. Siddhartha, like the times, was a changin'. 
He now looked at all of his luxuries as purposeless excesses. He remarked on how his youthful body was even more worthless than anything from an infomercial, because someday it would die. He understood that looking to pleasures was the wrong way to find meaning in his life. He was 29 now, and his first child, Rahula, or son of a Buddha, was just born. It was around this time he made, in what must have been the hardest decision of his life, the choice to leave the palace and look to end his anguish. He left the castle that night with his charioteer Chana and his snow-white horse Kanthaka. I found a lot of people disapprove of the Buddha due to this one moment in his life. Many people see him as abandoning his family, but that's only because it's really hard to understand the context of the setting. This was around 400-500 BC, and it was very common for people in his time and place to leave their worldly lives behind for spiritual purposes. It wasn't viewed as a terrible abandonment that it would be today. It was viewed as an acceptable way for people to try and better themselves. You have to remember there weren't any churches around to go to. So people search for spirituality on their own, out in the wilderness, Walden style. Even if there was a church right across the street, it wouldn't have mattered because he wasn't allowed to leave the palace anyway, remember? So he did the only thing he could do. He snuck out of the palace, went into the forest with Chana, and started his journey to become a Buddha. All right, well, I'm going to stop here for today. Thank you for listening to Understanding Buddhism in America. My name is Mike, and if you'd like to contact me for shout-outs, questions, or comments, you can email me at understandingbuddhisminamerica at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time for part two, Buddha Strikes Back. <laughs>